So it is my pleasure today to welcome Ronald McFarlane as our speaker for the fourth Sunday seminar. Ronald is a member of Bathurst Street United Church, is a lifelong advocate for sustainable development. He has worked in Africa, Asia, Europe, and Canada. His career has spanned working for non-governmental organizations, the United Nations, the Ontario Ministry of the Environment, and the Toronto Public Health. Over the years, he has studied the impacts of environmental factors on health, air pollution, toxic chemicals, green space, urban environments, and climate change, among others. His presentation for us today is called Advocacy for Climate Change, a Reflection. Let us listen to how we can protect the shores and land that we learned about in today's scriptures, and not just our lands, but the lands of others and the shores of others as well. So please welcome Ronald as our fourth Sunday speaker. Thank you so much for inviting me to share a few thoughts with you. Let me go and move into share screen mode since I have a PowerPoint presentation. I would like to start by acknowledging that uh, I live on the ancestral lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Ashinaabe, Chippewas, Haudenosaunee, and Wendat people who came before them. I am grateful that they have shared the sacred land with the many settlers who came after them. And I recognize that we have not shared the bounties from this land fairly in return. And I have a duty to work towards the right relations. I always wondered where my passion for the environment and development came from. And I've never been able to pinpoint this, but I am sure that growing up in Africa must have influenced me. When I was young, we would go on safaris and I would go and enjoy the animals, which I always found were awesome. Yet at the same time, I knew that I had lived a more comfortable life than many others around me. I did not go hungry after a hard day's work. And I had a warm and dry shelter to sleep in. And if I got sick, I would be well attended to. And somehow all of this did not seem quite right. <clears throat> it seemed to me that somehow at the same time I saw the development going on and having an impact on the environment. So how do we address poverty in one side and preserve nature on the other side was something that came to me very early in my, I mean, I certainly had those thoughts when I, in my teens. And so started my quest to address poverty and at the same time as preserving the natural world. One of the things I would note is I would not be here to tell you this tale if it was not for the advancement in me of modern medicine, one of the great achievements of our society. Yet, this advance has occurred in a context that has exploited nature as well as many people. So when I came back from hospital uh, <coughs> um, late last fall, in the fall, I checked my mailbox and also my LinkedIn posts. And these are some of the things I had in my mailbox. I'm trying to keep life positive, but things are slipping out of my hands. I am part of a system I disagree with. How can I unite people to make this stop? And this stop is climate change stop. Do people still care or get upset when they hear about the terrible things humans are doing to this earth? And then we have the climate deniers. How 
can the little bit of carbon dioxide humans are emitting be the cause of the changes we are seeing, they say. So why keep keeping? Oops, what am I doing now? I'm pushing the wrong button, it's going too far. I'll start by answering the question, why keep speaking about deforestation, wildfires, heat waves, hurricanes, floods, melting permafrost, and everything else? I say information is power. If we do not make the bad news known, then no one will know, and no one will have a reason to think that action is needed. It's like burying one's head in the sand. Therefore, we must continue to highlight these negative outcomes and the mounting evidence of the role of modern society in these events. But will people act on this information? Some may move to denial, others to anger or depression. So nostalgia the term used to describe the feelings of despair related to environmental destruction and climate change. So we even have a word for this. Then we have anger and dealing with depression can motivate action. Taking action to ameliorate the situation is a way to maintain one's mental health in face of societal procrastination. So I say, use your sphere of influence to mobilize action. Everyone has a sphere of influence. For some, it is small. For others, it is large. Maybe you feel you have done everything you can and the changes that are needed are still not happening. To that, I would say, think of one thing you could do tomorrow that you have not yet tried and that could make a difference. And that could nudge an individual, a community, a corporation, a government. Do it. And it doesn't really matter what this action is. As long as it isn't a step in the right direction that builds upon the other steps, over time, the actions can snowball. So it must not be paralyzed by all this bad news. But then there are people who do not see a need for change. What do we do about them? There are people who are happy with the current situation and do not see a reason to change. Or sometimes others feel that the situation is outside of human control, so why bother? Simon Sinek, who is a communication guru, says that we who would advocate for climate action have our message wrong. Because it is not about saving the planet, it is about us. It is about keeping the planet livable for us. So, when we change the frame of reference this way, it allows us to find a shared purpose with others, even those who disagree with us. And that purpose, shared purpose, I suggest, is our health and well being. We advocates for climate often say that the problem is Western society, or modern science and technology, colonialism, white privilege. But when we say these things, it negates the positive achievements that have occurred since in the, the Industrial Revolution. And it makes people become defensive. It creates barriers between us and them. I just invite you to look at what is around you, what you do every day, 
and you will see how much we rely on what industrial society has created. At the same time, Brazil, China, India want the material wealth that the Europe and North America have. So the message needs to be more about how we build a better world for all. And while there are divergent views at what a better world would look like, I am certain there are more com commonalities and these commonalities outweigh any differences. And we can use these common commonalities to help design a better future. While the present development paradigm is premised on forever increasing economic growth. And we can see that there has been a parallel path between economic growth and average life expectancy, which has gone from less than 30 years in 1770 to 72 years in 2019, which is why I have these two graphs here. This is the graph, the top one shows how we our GDP has increased over time. And this is the life expectancy, not quite the same scale because 1870 here is 1870 here. But as you can see, as the world has become richer, our life expectancy, which is as good a measure as you can get of what our health and well being is, has increased. So let's, that's part of the dilemma I think that we are facing here. I've do it and done it again. Yeah. So I see three streams of thought on the way forward. And that is the technological paradigm, the degrowth paradigm, and the social justice paradigm. That's how I've described them. And I'll speak a to each of them. The technological approach is the most widespread view. It <coughs> sees the development and adoption of renewable energy, regenerative agriculture, the circul circular economy as the way forward. Innovation is a way to address our human needs and meet the environmental constraints. We do know that right now, uh, <clears throat> renewable energy is the cheapest energy in 2020. And therefore it was actually would be quite possible and many people have done so. And this is one graph that demonstrates that to, in fact, it is technologically possible to move to net zero in, by 2050, which is the goal of the International Panel on Climate Change. The advantage of the technological approach is that it fits within the current development paradigm and in some ways is the easiest to implement. So I say, Technological innovation is a good place to start. Then <coughs> there is <coughs> the critics of the technological paradigm highlight that it does not address the fundamental cause behind climate change and environmental de degradation, which is the exponential growth of material required to support economic growth. They also note that improvements in technology have usually resulted in greater consumption and increased efficiency, lowers the cost of production and makes products affordable to more people. So just focusing on efficiency has, is not sufficient. <clears throat> so we have the degrowth movement which says that we need to recognize the limits to growth and that we need to stay, our economic system has to stay within the planetary boundaries. 
so they say we have to stop or even re reduce economic growth so that humans can remain within the ecological limits of the planet. I have personally always been convinced on the, uh, of the underlying premise of the 1972 Club of Road, Rome report, Limits to Growth. While the report has been much maligned as being too negative and dismissive of human ingenuity, I see its core challenge as calling us to create a different economic paradigm. But that said, degrowth is a hard sell. Can we really demonstrate that it can really lead to a better life for all? Because as we have seen, increased economic activity has increased our material well being, has increased life expectancy. So there is the question is, if we don't have economic growth, can we actually have a better life for all? It's a big challenge. And I think that that's something that I'm not sure I know how to answer. But we do know that many uh, great uh, philosophers, Jesus among them, and the Buddha and others before him and after him, have really encourage all of us to live a more simple life as being the most meaningful life. So there is something uh, for us to work with here. And I clearly say, think that it is possible to integrate this, the concept of planetary boundaries into the technological approach. And this is where I have here in front of you this uh, donut diagram, which the donuts economics model that has been popularized by Kate Rayworth of uh, Oxford University and previously with Oxfam. It's a way of trying to think about ha been having a middle ground in our economy where we have enough for social well being, but not too much to destroy the world, the environment. But some will say that's still not the right focus. And I have to say, one of the things I find disheartening is how even within the sort of the climate change movement, uh, people who have different opinions and different thoughts argue with each other, and in fact, don't listen to each other and feel nearly as bad among each other as climate deniers among uh, and everybody else. So I do think there needs to be some way for us to to move a bit forward uh, on on this more collaboratively. So the donut economics framework uh, does emphasize an equal consideration between meeting social societal needs, base needs, and planetary boundaries. But the social justice paradigm says that we should be focusing first and foremost on addressing inequalities. Uh, you're recognizing that the distribution of wealth is the key factor that prevents a sustainable economy. It points to the failure of the technological approach, which has tended to increase inequalities over time. As the benefits of innovation get captured by a small group within society. The environmental justice movement emphasizes the reappropriation of indigenous lands, reparations for past inequities ensuring disadvantaged communities do not bear the brunt of adverse impacts when they do not enjoy a fair share of the benefits. It calls for a shift of power and wealth within society so that it is more equally distributed. Yeah, I think there are tensions here. I actually think that what is the right balance between historical climate emissions and the rights of development, and thus the current emissions among different nations or among different people? And as you can see in this diagram, in terms of the, uh, the squares, 
historical emissions, the US and the EU have by far the most. And in fact, most of the developed countries have more than half. But <clears throat> this issue of how to allocate or to address uh, historical emissions was in fact what killed the 2009 Copenhagen climate talks because no agreement could be reached on how to assign historical uh, responsibility to climate change. If we can't agree on these things, we get stuck. So who is responsible? And how much should be historical responsibility and how much should be current responsibility? So what is the responsibility of people currently living in high emission countries? And that is US, UK and other rich countries for the emissions of their ancestors. I, the current per capita GDP of Shanghai is close to that of the Netherlands. So is it fair for uh, <clears throat> uh, poor people living in the Netherlands to pay a carbon tax while middle, middle and high income people in Shanghai do not? Uh, should the cost of emissions be tied to the producer or to the consumer? What is clear is that household income is actually the best indicator of carbon emissions and ecological footprint. And it doesn't matter where you live. If you are rich, you have a higher carbon footprint. And if you are poor, you have a lower one. The richest 10% are responsible for around 50% of global emissions. My contention has been, and this is where you see, is that for some, that social justice folks have always emphasized the historical emissions as being what is, needs to be addressed. Whereas I would say that that is a bit thinking in terms of retribution and therefore, as opposed to looking at restorative justice as an approach. So my, uh, <clears throat> so that I think is my premise that we should be focusing more on the future rather than the past. But it is also quite clear to me that it's not possible to effectively reduce emissions or maintain our ecological footprint within planetary boundaries without equity. Because as long as a group of people has access and uses more than their fair share of resources, others will want it and may even fight for it. So while equity is central, arriving at an agreement has been very elusive. And that is because groups and nations are primarily driven by self-interest so they look at things from their own perspective only and don't look at a solution that is fair for all. So, so why not focus on building a healthier world for all? A more equal society has health benefits for both low income and high income groups. So in a more equal society, people have better health, both people on, who are poor and the people who are richer. So there is in fact a common um, agenda here that you can share. Rich people will be better in a more equal society. They'll be better off. So let's work with them to make a better a society that's better off by addressing inequalities because everybody will be better off. At the same time, we know that healthy people need a healthy planet to live on. 
We all benefit from cleaner air, clean water, nutritious food, and so forth. So, in summary, I will say, we who advocate for environmental protection and social justice need to have enough humility to reach out instead of only opposing. <clears throat> we need to seek understand, to understand people who are coming from a different perspective. And we ne need to start from where they are. We have to work to find the common ground. And I suggest a common goal can be both greater fairness and better health for all. I think we don't do enough to acknowledge the positives of the current world. As we work together to remove the negatives. And as well, I would say we need to assume that we don't have all the solutions. We have to be open to different approaches and see if they will work. And here I will thought I would end with a quote from Dr. David Suzuki. While there are numerous solutions to climate change, ideological differences, national interests, corporate priorities, religious pressures, political timidity, and legal structures all act to block real action. All the while, the reality of climate change becomes ever more obvious and di dire. I have no idea that the final pass will or should be. I only know that if we keep putting ourselves and our inventions ahead of nature's law, we will bicker away and try to resolve the issue with incremental changes here and there. So I'm glad that Dr. Suzuki doesn't have the answer because I don't. So I feel a bit better that I don't. But I think we can say that to create a better world, we need all hands on deck. The people who think like us and the people who think differently. I think I say thank you here. <laughs>